Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be with you all today, and I thank you um, for inviting me to be here. Um, you're innovators, entrepreneurs, manufacturers, technology leaders. You are the driving force uh, behind our thriving economy, and I want to thank you uh, for what you do daily. As you know, and, and every American should know, we have always led the world in innovation and technology. It's a kind of ingenuity that you all possess that has helped create the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. And it's the most exciting time in the world to be alive, I think. You're tackling the challenges of the future, and I think Mr. Koenig was talking about that a little bit as I came in. Uh, creating jobs that have never existed before, developing new technologies that are changing, that's changing people's lives and transforming the global economy. Simply put, America's success depends on your success. But in many ways, right now, we're at a crossroads as a nation. In order to maintain America's role as the global leader in economic growth and innovation, we need to advance policies that empower workers and entrepreneurs to succeed in the 21st century workforce. And I got the sense that's what you were talking about. With a new Congress and a new administration, we have an opportunity to do just that. From a persistent skills gap to regulatory obstacles facing both workers and employers, there are no shortage of issues we need to address urgently. As chair of the House Committee on Education and the Workforce, I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing the work we're doing here in Washington to confront these challenges with bold, positive solutions. Let me talk a little bit about the skills gap. Education leaders and employers, as well as student and worker advocates, all agree the country's skill mismatch or skills gap is a real problem. As a former teacher and higher ed administrator, I know firsthand that too many students enter the workforce without the skills they need. And survey after survey is telling us that. According to current estimates, more than 6 million jobs will go unfilled by the year 2020, due in part to the skills gap. I'm sorry I didn't hear again the previous presentation to see if my numbers match up with what you were hearing. Is that close? Close. Okay. Good. The technology industry in particular faces a concerning shortage of skilled workers. By 2020, 1.4 million software development jobs and 1 million programming jobs will go unfilled. And by the way, let me, let me uh, deviate based on something I heard Mr. Koenig say. You, you will never hear me use what I call the T word, and that is trained workers, because I don't think we should use that word in conjunction with human beings. We should always talk about skills and education. So you will hear me talking about a shortage of skilled workers or a shortage of people with skills to meet the needs. Because you train animals and you educate people. And I hope if you don't remember anything else that I say today, I hope you'll remember that. And, and I will also say that there is no, that all education is vocational education. Because I don't know a soul that goes to get a baccalaureate degree or a master's degree or a doctorate that doesn't want a job. So keep that in mind. It's clear we need to do a better job of preparing individuals with the knowledge and technical skills they need to compete for the jobs of the future or even open their own startup company someday. That means providing state and local leaders more flexibility and encouraging innovative learning opportunities. Just as importantly, it also means building better community partnerships to ensure education leaders and local employers are working together. These goals guided our efforts a few years ago to overall the nation's workforce development system. 
I was proud to champion the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act which in the House we call the Skills Act, which was a much better name for it in my opinion. And one of the critical reforms in that bill was to, was to provide employers a greater role in our workforce development system. How do we do that? We significantly reduced the number of so-called partners on state and local workforce investment boards. For too long, the voices of employers were being drowned out by petty infighting and special interest grandstanding on the part of government bureaucrats. There are too many cooks in the kitchen and very little getting done. By streamlining the number of representatives on these boards, we put employers back in the driver's seat of our workforce development system. It's now up to employers to seize this opportunity, work with education leaders, and build a system responsive to the needs of employers and the needs of workers. As an example, Toyota created the TTAM Workforce Development Program, a partnership between Toyota community colleges, uh, schools that teach skills, and others to help educate and place thousands of factory certified technicians in dealerships throughout the United States. And they cannot get enough people graduating from those programs to fill the needs of the dealerships. These are exciting opportunities taking place, but more work needs to be done. At the committee, we'll work closely with the Trump administration to ensure the law is implemented as Congress intended. We'll also build on these reforms as we work to strengthen career and technical education. Career and technical education, or CTE, has helped countless men and women acquire the knowledge and skills they need to prepare for a wide range of high wage careers, from computer science and information technology to manufacturing and engineering. Yet there's still a false perception that CTE is somehow the other option or backup plan for students who do not pursue a baccalaureate degree. Nothing could be further from the truth. If we're going to close the skills gap, we're going to have to change the way we think about CTE. We're also going to have to change our CTE policies. The federal law that supports state and local CTE programs hasn't been updated in more than a decade. Between technological advances and a changing economy, students, workers, and employers face different realities than they did 10 years ago. We need a law that reflects those realities, and that's precisely what the committee is working on today. In the coming weeks, it's our intention to move forward with CTE reforms based on a number of core principles. First, we need to empower state and local leaders to respond to changing education, economic, and technological needs. This includes simplifying the application process for receiving taxpayer dollars and providing local leaders more flexibility to make their programs work for their students. Second, we need to support innovative learning opportunities and build better community partnerships. Again, this must include stronger engagement with local employers. In other words, we need to make sure employers and education leaders are working together to provide students the skills they need to fill in-demand jobs in their communities. Third, we need to improve accountability to ensure CTE programs are delivering real results and hardworking taxpayer dollars are being well spent. Finally, we need to reduce the federal career role in career and technical education and limit the federal government's ability to intervene in state and local decisions. We won't solve our nation's skills gap with a one-size-fits-all uniform solution. We need to ensure states have room to innovate and tailor programs to meet the unique needs of local industries. Last year, the House passed with overwhelming bipartisan support a bill that reflects these principles. It's my hope we will complete this important work in the months ahead. It's an important step toward empowering the next generation of innovators, entrepreneurs, and technology leaders. However, helping more Americans succeed in the 21st century workforce requires a multifaceted approach. Not only must we prepare students with the skills they need to enter the workforce, we also have to ensure federal rules and regulations don't make it harder for workers to succeed in their careers. The American workforce has rapidly evolved over the years, 
groundbreaking innovation and technology have transformed our economy and changed the way we live, work, and connect with others. These changes have led to the sharing economy. Freedom, innovation, flexibility, convenience. Those are a few of the things we think of when we think about the sharing economy. It's an economy driven by millennials who now represent the majority of the U.S. workforce. They're drawn to the idea of financial independence and flexible work arrangements. But it's not just millennials participating in the sharing economy. In fact, you may be surprised to hear that my husband and I are actually Airbnb hosts. <laughs> There's no, no question that this new economy has improved the quality of life for many Americans, whether it's by providing affordable places to stay, expanding transportation options, or creating new job opportunities. These online services have become a part of our daily lives and for the better. The fact that we've seen this type of growth and innovation during these challenging economic times is a remarkable thing. It's a testament to the strength of our economy and the resilience of the American people. It's important that federal policies do not limit the innovation that is taking place or undermine the flexible work opportunities so many Americans now depend on. That's why we need to take a close look at federal workforce policies. Today, workers, employers, and entrepreneurs are living under policies of the 1930s. Think about that. Those policies were put in place nearly a century ago. When the Fair Labor Standards Act was signed into law, we were in the Great Depression. We didn't have the competitive global economy we have today. We didn't have smartphones. We didn't have the internet. So much has changed. Why haven't our nation's workforce rules and regulations? This outdated regulatory structure is complicated enough for most American workers and employers, but for those in the sharing economy, it simply doesn't make sense. It's like, it's like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. The self-employed individuals who rely on the sharing economy for work don't fit neatly into obsolete job categories defined in another area, and most aren't looking for rigid nine to five work schedules. They want the freedom and flexibility to control their own time and schedules without federal rules standing in their way. The bottom line is our nation's workforce policy don't reflect the realities of the 21st century workforce. We all want workers to have strong protections, and we can all agree that workers need retirement security and access to high quality, affordable health care. The sharing economies create opportunities and challenges in how to address these important priorities. It sparked an important debate on how we can modernize the policies of the past to meet the needs of the future. I encourage you all to be engaged in that debate. The people in this room have more ideas than those in Washington on how we can support the creativity of entrepreneurs and encourage an environment where opportunity, economic growth, and job creation can flourish. Just as importantly, become involved in our efforts to close the Skills Act. Learn who has a seat on your state and local workforce investment boards. As leaders in the technology industry, I encourage you to reach out and build partnerships with your local schools and community colleges. Finally, continue to make your voices heard here in Washington. We want your ideas, your concerns, and your insights to help inform and shape the work ahead. Never underestimate the power you have to make a difference. I have to say, I never dreamed I'd chair a committee in Congress one day or that I'd ever serve in Congress, for that matter. I grew up in a very poor community and overcame some tough challenges. There's no doubt many of the people in this room have overcome their own set of challenges through hard work and determination, and you've achieved incredible success. I hope we can all work together to help more Americans pursue their dreams and achieve them. We face a historic opportunity. We need to roll up our sleeves and seize it. It's an honor and a privilege to work alongside of you as we do just that. Thank you very much again for allowing me to be with you. Take a seat. We'll do okay. a brief question and answer period here about some of your work and some of your uh, ideas for ways that we can modernize both labor and education policy. Um, I want to start with the Airbnb side of things because I think that that piqued everyone's interest, right? You got a, quite a bit of applause for that. Uh, 
what I want to know is... I don't fit the stereotype. <laughs> I, I think that's the important thing is that there isn't a stereotype, right? And these platforms are accessible for anyone that has an internet connection. Sure. Uh, and what we're curious about is how you and your husband came to think of using a sharing economy platform, right? You have an idle resource, but what made you take that leap to say, we're going to be Airbnb hosts? Well, I had to call my husband last night for him to remind me of how that happened. Uh, uh, my, husband, um, my husband has a baccalaureate degree in political science, spent a year working on a master's thinking he might become a teacher after he decided not to become a lawyer. So we've been entrepreneurs all our lives. He became a community planner, then quit his job because he had to work away from home and wanted to be at home. We went in the nursery and landscaping mm -hmm. business. So we, we had a startup business and, and we've been in and we went into construction. And about, I was trying to think when it was, probably about eight years ago, I finally got Tom to get on a computer. And I knew when I did that it was probably going to be a mistake. Uh, uh, he's a very, very sharp guy. And he spent a lot of time, first couple of years, doing genealogy research and even thinking about writing a book. But he uses the computer a lot. Uh, but he also loves to do construction and, uh, and remodeling. And we live in just the most beautiful place in the world, between Boone and Banner Elk, North Carolina. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it's a, it's a fabulous place. And we've struggled all our lives to live in the community where he grew up, which is only about 12 miles from where I grew up. And we both grew up extraordinarily poor, by the way. Anyway, um, he, we have built, he's been in the construction business three or four times, and we were, we bought some land, built our own house two years ago, and he did the supervising and all of that. And there was a little piece of property on the way into ours with an old, old house, almost 100 years old cabin in it. And uh, I told him he should burn it down or let the fire department burn it down because it was in pretty bad shape. But he decided to remodel it, and he did. It's a little one-bedroom. Um, I think it's probably about 900 square feet. And so then we were faced with what to do. We own a duplex that we rent, and uh, he was really tired of renting property. And he was trying to think of what to do. And he was exploring different options. And a friend of ours told him that their kids had used Airbnb. And so Tom got on the internet. <laughs> and uh, started exploring different options. And he decided, in, rather than rent on a permanent basis, that it would be better to go through Airbnb. So our daughter, who runs our nursery and landscaping business, we actually turned it over to her years ago, um, she manages it. And she now, I've forgotten, I should have called her and asked her what classification she has, but we've, it's been on the market since last fall, I think it's rented 17 times. Wow. Um, and every time she has gotten outstanding ratings. And so she's in some special category. Oh, that's wonderful. Because every rating has been so positive. And I'm sure they don't know that you're the chairwoman when they're getting Oh, no, the no, they have no idea. <laughs> they have no idea. Uh, but it's been, a, it's been a great experience. And uh, my chief of staff has used Airbnb a lot. And when Tom was exploring whether to do it or not, I mentioned it um, to my staff, and, and uh, Cyrus said, I love Airbnb. I use it all the time. And so that's how we chose Airbnb. Uh, I know there are other options out there, but that's how, that's how we chose it. And it is an, it's a, a lovely little cabin on the Watauga River, and uh, it's, it's a great location. Well, I might be your next guest. Okay. <laughs> So how Sign up quick. <laughs> how, how has that experience as an Airbnb host framed your work on the committee then? You, you're also a participant in the sharing economy now. Right. And of course, we use Uber all the time in D.C. in particular and other places uh, and, and other parts of the sharing economy. While I don't personally use a lot of these things, I'm very much aware of it. And I'm a big promoter 
of using every form of technology that's available to us. I'll tell you, when I was in the North Carolina legislature, I, uh, we first got computers, and I loved them, absolutely loved them. And uh, even before that, I was in the administration, and when I was in the legislature, they came to me and said, would you serve on a committee, uh, a technology co committee? And I turned around, I said, you've got to be kidding. You've got to have people who know more about technology than I do. And out of 50 senators, they said there were only five senators in those days that read and answered their own emails. And so we've come a long way. So I'm a huge promoter, again, of innovation and technology. And so I want to make it all possible. I just believe it will make our country better. I know that there are downsides to it, but there are downsides to everything. Uh, we need, we obviously want secure technology, as secure as it can be. But I'll tell you, my brother used to work for the telephone company, and he told me 40 years ago, Virginia, just assume that every conversation you're having on the telephone is being listened to by somebody else. Forty years ago he told me that, so I've always assumed that. So we only have a few more minutes and I want to pivot to the other side of the committee which is the education side and I know that's where you have very deep personal experience both you know, as an educator and as a college president. Uh, in that experience when you were actually working in the education space did you feel like our education system was adequately preparing workers for the jobs of tomorrow? Um, not in recent years. I don't think our education system has done that. Now, there are segments of the education system that do that. This, there, I left the university, so I, I had a great experience at Appalachian State University. I don't have any negative comments to make. But I left Appalachian to go to the community college because I believed so fervently that the community colleges were able to pivot much more quickly to meet the needs of the community and to meet the needs of the area. We must have some community college people here. Uh, and they are. And the for-profit sector sometimes, and the private sector, is sometimes even as able to do that. And so I get frustrated sometimes with the university systems for not responding more um, directly to what needs to be developed. And I saw something this week, uh, and I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier about the T word. I, mentioned, I, I saw something that said, uh, uh, colleges and universities are in trouble and they've got to do more with T programs. I don't even like to say the word. And I thought to myself, I'm a liberal arts graduate. I have an undergraduate degree in English, straight out English. I wanted to be a high school English teacher, but I was too poor to quit work and do student teaching. So I wound up with a degree in English. Then I went back and got a Master of Arts in college teaching so I could teach at the college level. Uh, but I'm not opposed to liberal arts education. I'm a huge supporter of liberal arts education. We want everybody, though, to come out of an educational program with critical thinking skills, good communication skills, good computational skills. Everybody needs those, not just people who are going to go on and get a master's, go on and get a doctorate. We need a few of those people in the world, too. But mostly we need people with all kinds of skills. And I know my skills in using a computer, using an iPhone, all of those things, they're sort of limited because I don't have time to work on them. But I understand their capabilities. And what I want is for students to have those choices to go in the direction that will help them the most. Because I, that's what this country's all about, having choices throughout your life. And you know, 30 years ago, people were saying, folks are going to change careers seven times in their lives. I don't know what you all are saying about it now. But we felt that way a long time ago. And so we have to prepare people again with those basic skills and basic skills are still 
reading, writing, computation, critical thinking. Those are basic skills. But in addition, you have to know how to use a computer, you have to know how to search, and you have to know how to adapt to new things. And I think that's, that's one of the things that we have to, that we have to teach people but, and help them be comfortable with. I'm not too crazy about these uh, comfort rooms or whatever they call them on campuses. You know, there are going to be challenges in life. And you're going to have to learn to deal with them. That's one of the skill sets you need. Well, Chairwoman, we're looking forward to working with you on those challenges. Unfortunately, we're out of time here, though. Very much appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.